Uh, next Sunday will be a special Sunday because we will recognize our high school graduates. And uh, Debbie Akohiro has uh, offered once again, uh, she put together the Mother's Day video, which was so terrific. Um, and uh, she's working on one for our uh, high school graduates. So you want to make that. Um, I am uh, going on vacation from this week. And uh, so the uh, services um, uh, will be slightly different here and there. Exactly in what way? I am not sure. Being Pentecost, I'm going to let the spirit move and uh, we'll, we'll see what comes up. There will be services. And uh, next Sunday, Pastor Neil McPherson will be bringing the message. And the two Sundays after that, uh, Scott Herzer will be uh, preaching. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, it'll be fun. <laughs> I, I will be popping in and out. I, will, I won't be entirely absent, except uh, probably on the first Sunday of June. So the first Sunday of June, we are not celebrating communion. We'll just bump it to the, the second Sunday in, in June. And remember that we're aiming to go to a, uh, an in-person service here at the end of June, the last Sunday in June and plans are, are scheduled, uh, are being uh, worked on for that. Uh, one other announcement in uh, my breakout the, this morning at 10 o'clock, uh, we will have uh, another uh, short video from the uh, series on the church that we're doing. Uh, and we're also gonna have an extra video uh, in honor of uh, tomorrow being Bob Dylan's 80th birthday. So, <laughs> uh, I couldn't resist. Uh, anything else we need to announce before we begin? All right, then. Our reader this morning is Keith Kuboyama. Good morning, everyone. The Spirit gathers us to worship God and builds us up in faith hope, and love, so that we may go into the world to proclaim the gospel and to work for justice and peace. Alleluia. Let us worship God together. And our song is the Spirit Song. Satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. Jesus. Oh, Jesus, come and fill your lands. Jesus, oh, Jesus, come and fill. Come and sing this song with gladness 
as your hearts are filled with joy, lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. Oh, give him all your tears and sadness, give him all your years of pain. And you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your life. Thank you to our praise and production teams. Let us pray together. Gracious God, today we celebrate the pouring out of your spirit upon the church at Pentecost, completing the gift of your son begun at Christmas. Jesus promised the spirit to his disciples and the coming of the spirit upon all flesh, not just for just a few, like prophets, priests, and kings in the days of old. And this spirit would be our counselor, comforter, and guide, leading us into all truth. But the spirit would also empower the church with gifts and fruit, signs of heavenly life, nourishing your work already in our here and now. Give us grace, O God, to be open to your spirit in ways that will promote your purpose and your will for us as your church. Save us from misguided and misinformed understandings of spiritual power that promote instead worldly and damaging behaviors. The following of charismatic leaders who make a mockery of moral standards. The casting aside of common sense disguised as having faith. And the pursuit of the spectacular while ignoring the needs of our neighbor. We confess, O oh God, that too often your church has pursued and promoted the spectacular, mega this and awesome that, often claiming that such results must be due to your spirit at work. But too often the results that attract and excite us are like fizzy foam on a sweet drink, catching attention but without substance and fleeting. Your church, the body of Christ, needs more. The life of the world needs more. And your spirit indeed offers what we all need. Who could be poor or in need if their life was surrounded by and filled with love, joy, and peace? With patience, goodness, and kindness. With gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So continue to nurture and nourish your life among us and through us as Makiki Christian Church, as we continue to wrestle with questions about what it means to be your church and this church in particular. We are glad for the ceasefire in Israel and Gaza, but we know there is a long way to go. May wisdom, empathy, understanding and shrewdness guide the way forward to a more peaceful future for this region. And we continue to pray for the many divisive and unsettling things happening in our own country that threaten the unity we need to be a United States of America. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken. For we pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now our scripture reading from Ezekiel 37. Good morning. The Valley of the Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. And I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling noise, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and the tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I've done it, declares the Lord. Welcome back, Scott. Got to unmute. Thank you. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. I want to start today by giving a little pop quiz. And I apologize for not giving you time to prepare, but I'm a teacher and that's just how I roll. Actually, I'm not really sorry. I'm going to pass everyone whether you get it right or not. But if you do get it right, I'm going to pass you higher. It's only one question. Some of you may have heard of the contemporary Christian hard rock band called Skillet. Yes, the band is named after a frying pan. And some of you may have heard of a singing group called the Delta Rhythm Boys, whose heyday was in the 40s and 50s. And if you haven't heard of either of those, then I'm pretty sure you've heard of William Shakespeare. Now, if you've heard of all three of these artists, and if your brain is as warped as mine is, then you might have a fighting chance of getting this question right. Here's the question. Aside from being artistic groups or individuals, what do these three, Skillet, the Delta Rhythm Boys, and Shakespeare have in common? And please make sure your answer is in the form of a question. The answer is, what is original writing about today's passage, The Valley of Dry Bones? Both musical groups have lyrics that are clearly related to today's passage, while the Shakespeare connection is a bit more oblique. In fact, I'm pretty sure you know one of the songs. The Delta Rhythm Boys song includes the lyric, the hip bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones connected to the shin bone, the shin bones connected to the ankle bone, on and on and on. 
Yep, that's their song. There's a charming video on YouTube of them singing the song, and the camera quite helpfully goes up one side of the singer's bodies and down the other in unison with the lyrics, as if you wouldn't know where a shin was or a knee or a hip. It's very helpful and breathtaking, I have to add. The Skillet song is just as breathtaking, but in a completely different way, as you might imagine from a hard rock band. Think of musicians smashing their guitars on stage and screaming lyrics so crazily loud, all in the name of Jesus, but literally no one can understand them. But when you read the lyrics on paper, you see phrases like, light it up, light it up, now I'm burning, feel the rush, feel the rush of adrenaline. We are young, we are strong, we will rise, because I'm back, back, back from the dead tonight. To the floor, to the floor, hit the red line, flying high, flying high at the speed of light, full of love, full of light, full of fight, because I'm back, back, back from the dead tonight. And Shakespeare in Twelfth Night writes of one's body being thrown to the ground, surrounded by other bodies, and it's such a mess of bones that his lover will never find him. I mentioned these examples this morning for one important reason. They speak to how deeply the Ezekiel passage has made its way into far and disparate corners of our artistic culture. I can't know for sure, frankly, how the passage got there, though I can guess two reasons why it's ended up in such deep recesses of our, of our conscious, uh, social conscience. First, the story has science fiction qualities to it. It took me a while to really grasp the picture of what was physically happening in this passage. This is not just some southwestern desert movie scene with the bones of a dead horse lying here and cattle skulls over there, a hot sun baking the air, while a lonely cowboy in the distance desperately looks for water. Yes, all that is there, the hot, rugged valley, the dry, parched air, but the bones, the sheer quantity of bones that must have been there, I'm not sure I can still imagine it. But I do know there are a lot of bones, and the vision of it would be devastatingly haunting if not for the second thing, and that is the message of hope that God leaves with Ezekiel. Before we get to that, I do want to point out that I think there is some inadvertent humor on the part of Ezekiel, and maybe even on God's part, although I'm not sure God can inadvertently be funny. But when God asks Ezekiel, mortal, can these bones live? I think Ezekiel's response is borderline hilarious. Uh, and this is my translation. Um, I have no idea, but I bet you do. Am I right or am I right? By this point in his life as a prophet, I'm sure Ezekiel's figured out a thing or two about the manner in which God is using him. Like, don't try to read God's mind and don't try to guess at the message too quickly. Let God's truth unfold. So Ezekiel doesn't even try to answer the question. And then the passage goes from this kind of rhetorical question, <clears throat> this idea about whether something dead can come alive again, to Ezekiel getting some in-your-face reality. God says, Prophesy this, Ezekiel. Tell the bones to listen to you and tell them God says breath will enter them and they will live. Tendons and cartilage will come together again and flesh will cover it all and skin will cover that flesh and then the breath of life will make them walk. When that happens, you will know that I am Lord. Now, Ezekiel is a good prophet, so he does what he's told and then there's this great rattling noise as the bones all come together and do exactly what God says they're going to do. They become living bodies of the Grateful Dead. The whole scene is like a kind of reverse zombie movie where the zombies have been dead for so long they aren't even walking anymore. And then suddenly they're not zombies any longer. They're completely healed. And they return to life like human versions of those robots in the Transformer movies, Optimus Prime, Megatron, and Bumblebee. When they rise from the dead, they're like great dancing fools, ready for action. And who wouldn't be after being restored to life after years and years in the hot desert as a parched set of bones? So why is this passage considered a partner passage to the description of Pentecost in the book of Acts? 
I think the most important parallel is that in Ezekiel, God promises to return his people from years of exile in Babylon to their homeland. He won't leave them again. He won't abandon them. And of course, that is largely the same message of Pentecost. What began as a promise of salvation in the life of Christ became unclear to the disciples in the wake of his death and resurrection. It was a time of confusion and doubt, even among those who had witnessed his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. Pentecost marks the beginning of the Christian church, God breathing life into his believers metaphorically like the bodies resurrected in Ezekiel. But in Ezekiel's time, only a few special people could really interpret God's spirit for everyone. Prophets, priests, people like that. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is available to everyone. The Holy Spirit has a binding effect among the people of Christ. Like the sinews connecting bones together, the Holy Spirit connects us to each other and to God, and it is here for everyone. And while the Holy Spirit may be taking a quieter role among us now than it did with the disciples, it is just as real, just as present. We may not witness, as the first believers did, disciples bringing the dead to life or healing the sick with their shadows, or surviving deadly snake bites, or hear hundreds of fellow Christians speaking in foreign languages. What we do witness, every day we have eyes to see, are the gifts of the Spirit that Paul writes so beautifully about in his letter to the Galatians. The gifts of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These gifts are like an ethereal counterpoint to the phrase where two or more are gathered in Jesus' name, he is there with them. Well, wherever these gifts of the Spirit are expressed by any one of us, the Holy Spirit is at work right then and there. And it's not a spirit exclusive to religious leaders, kings, queens, and others of human stature considered above us. The Holy Spirit is a gift available to everyone. In the recent film, Minari, a Korean family, including a grandma, has moved to Arkansas in search of a better life. Then the grandma has a stroke. As she's recovering while lying in her bed one day, she sees something hovering over her dresser that no one else can see. But whatever it is, it clearly distresses her, but she can't explain it. Paul is a new friend of the family who works with the father and is told about grandma seemingly pointing at nothing. Now, Paul is a Pentecostal Christian. And while the Korean family, of course, is not, they go to church, but uh, I think the fruits of the Spirit in the way we imagine them in a Pentecostal church is probably not part of their repertoire. Now, Paul is a strange bird. He spontaneously drops to his knees in a prayer without regard to where he is or what he's doing. He speaks in tongues at random times, and on Sundays he walks down dirt roads, dragging a big cross over his shoulder. In this moment with Grandma, he goes into her room, and she points to the dresser again, and he slowly approaches the spot, crouches down before the dresser, claps his hands, and rebukes whatever is there, calling it to come out and leave the Grandma alone, like Jesus calling demons out of a possessed man. I found this scene incredibly moving not only because of the freedom Paul felt in expressing his faith in front of people who could hardly understand him, but also because of the pure mystery of what Grandma saw and what Paul saw and how they both responded to it. And I think that mystery is deeply connected to the Holy Spirit in ways just as important as kindness and gentleness and patience and joy and love. It is a personification of love, but a love that transcends culture and time and place and beliefs. It is as much of a miracle as Paul in the New Testament healing the sick and as much as any other showy thing the disciples ever did. In my own life, a moment of Pentecostal mystery for me occurred when I was in seminary. I had started to attend All Saints Episcopal Cathedral because it was one of the churches closest to campus. There wasn't much more thinking involved than that. I was raised in churches much like our own, where communion at most is once a month, and there's not a lot of extra bells and whistles. I would describe my worship experience to that point in my life as 
austere. But the Episcopal Church held all sorts of surprises for me, like communion every week, and the same pastoral prayer every week, and kneeling without warning. A few times there was even smoke from a big silver ball that the priest swung in front of him, a bit like Lawrence Welk moving his baton back and forth, conducting his orchestra. Everyone else there, of course, seemed to know when and how and why all this was happening, but I did not. On Pentecost Sunday, that day, the organ sounded like fanfare trumpets blasting out Hail the Festival Day, and there was red everywhere. A woman priest walked down the aisle swinging a long pole like the biggest fly rod in the world, with red and gold ribbons snapping from the end. Between all the sensory stimuli and my state of mind, I was overwhelmed. As I left the church, I was behind an elderly couple and when they went to shake the rector's hand, he practically leapt out of his shoes and grabbed both of their hands in each of his and leaning into them, he asked, were you moved, Bill, Miriam, were you? You could tell they were startled by how far and quickly they shied away from him. A brief look of disappointment crossed his face and then beaming again, he turned to me in the same state of excitement. He did not know who I was. But he leaned into me in the same way, and he said, were you moved? Were you? I said, I am overwhelmed. I really am. Thank God, he said. I couldn't tell if he was praising God or being sarcastic or was simply relieved that someone else had felt what he was feeling. And then I realized the spirit moves in its own way, in its own time, and it can move me unexpectedly from dry bones to rich life in an instant. And if it can do that for me, it can do that for anyone. We just have to pay attention to the love, graciousness, kindness, and patience that surrounds us every day. Amen. Lord, thank you for your good word from Ezekiel. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit. Help us listen to it. Help us respond to it. Help it help it enrich enrich our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Scott. This morning, David Kamita is going to share a few words with us. Welcome, David. Morning, everybody. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about how um, our online services and fellowship um, has really moved me and how it's really meant a lot to me so um yeah just just a little bit but um i'll be 37 this year so this makes about 37 years of attending makiki and um admittedly you know i've actually felt closer to the church this year um than any time i can really think of prior you know and i've and i've gone to church camp i've done interchurch uh sports uh i've played in our fit sunday praise team band and a lot more uh, over the time that me and my family have been in Makiki. But in the midst of this pandemic and everything that's come with it, I've um, you know been really privileged to feel and, and learn a lot of different things about myself and about my faith. Um, so, you know, I think it's assumed that generally the church community is one that you can really lean on in times of struggle and uh, uncertainty. But I don't really think um, it happens as often or... Um, you know, as it could or should. Um, so these talkback sessions that pastor has been having with us after church um, has really helped me in tremendous ways, not only spiritually, but mentally and, and physically too. You know, I've, I've been able to connect with uh, my fellow family in Christ, like the Sujimuras, like the Ashizawas, like Uncle Elton Gu, um, Lara Shigeta, you know, folks who I normally wouldn't see or have the chance to learn from. Um, I've also been able to seek wisdom you know, we've been asked, we've asked difficult questions of each other, of our faith. Uh, we've had deep conversations that have moved us um, to examine ourselves and learn more about the things we think we know before we judge others um, and to think thoughtfully. But all of it has been, you know, anchored in love instead of hate. Um, and, and finally, I've been able to feel love. You know, I, I think knowing that I'm not alone in wrestling with trying to be a good Christian and you know, asking those questions about what, what is a good Christian, 
and trying to understand um, what that means for me and my family and my community. Um, that really gives me comfort. So my faith's been really bolstered um, by the past year, but specifically, you know, Makiki, Makiki's steadfast love throughout all of it. Um, it's been a year, I think I'll point to um, for the rest of my life and say that I'm especially thankful that Makiki and God were present and faithful to me. Thank you. Wow, thanks, David. Amen. May the spirit touch you, infuse your life, open your eyes, warm your heart, and enable you to take part in God's love for his world. Go in peace. And unmute and let us pass the peace of Christ amongst one another.